and we would rent DVDs of movies we want to watch. I mean, who does that nowadays? This is the age of Netflix, is the age of on-demand video. So, did Netflix kill the video rental industry? No. The video rental industry killed itself because of insanely high late fees. Amazon is the world's largest retail company. They killed the retail industry because the retail industry had bad customer service. Airbnb has more accommodation than all the five-star hotels in the world and you put them together. The reason why Airbnb killed the hotel industry is because there was no consolidation amongst the industry. And my best and the favorite is Apple. Apple killed the music industry because the music companies were greedy and they forced you to buy an entire album even if you just love one song. So is technology the disruptor? Absolutely not. It's the lack of customer centricity and it's the lack of seamless customer experience that killed a lot of these legacy companies. And that's what makes this panel discussion super important. So we have an amazing set of panelists with a lot of experience in product development, product design, and I think they're the right set of people for us to really get started. And I want us to get started with Matt. Matt um, has been a creative guy. Um, he's been in the media side, so just the right person. So ladies and gentlemen, let's bring down the roof and let's welcome Matt for his opening address. Thanks, Guruba. Um, that's a really strong introduction. Thank you for that. Um, hang on, my clicker is not synchronizing. All right. So, I'm Matt. I'm the head of creative at socialgrows.com. And, uh, I'm sorry, this is really not connecting. Right, let's just keep talking first. Uh, so what we do at socialgrows.com, we are a, we are a digital, boutique digital agency. And what we do is we focus on digital, anything pretty much under the digital umbrella. We do brand outreach, influencer engagement. We also do, if and when necessary, crisis management for brands. Um, I pray to God we don't have to do it anymore, but it does happen from time to time. Next up, we also do... Aha, it has finally loaded. There we go. Right, so today's talk is on efficiency in content. So I'm going to bring your attention straight to efficiency. For how many creatives are in the room? Can I see a show of hands? Are there any creatives here? All right, love it, all right. So how many of you have heard, when, how many of you are scared when you hear someone from management say the word efficiency? Because, yeah, I see some hands. Because for creatives, it's such a dirty word because nine times out of 10, when someone says you need to be more efficient, they usually mean cost efficiency. So when you're being overly cost efficient, how much does that really impact your ability to deliver the message that you want to deliver? So which is why even though today we're talking about, supposed to be talking about efficiency, I would like to bring your attention to efficacy. And what efficacy means is efficient. How efficient is your messaging in making people remember what you're trying to tell them? How good is the brand recall? How good are all the other metrics that we can measure? Because cost efficiency is just one aspect of the entire thing. So, I'm from a media background as well. I spent the past three years leading a media startup uh, before I joined Social Groups. One of the things that we noticed a lot amongst our readers is that everyone wants a seamless media consumption experience. If I'm gonna consume some kind of media, and I think this will hold true for many of you, if I wanna consume it on my phone, and I stop halfway, I wanna be able to pick it up on my desktop. I wanna be able to pick it up on a different device and I want it to be seamless. I don't want anything to get in the way of my experience. And this holds true for a lot of us. So how do you efficiently ensure 
that your messaging is heard. So I'll bring you just right back to the 5W and 1H. These are the standard questions, which many of you will know. So if you try and craft the message, the very first thing you'll think about is what is the message you're trying to deliver, right? And then you move on to who you start, uh, I'm sending this message to. Who am I talking to? Then we go into the standard things here, demographics, age, location, interests. You start breaking it down into all the demographics. And then you go on to other things. How are you going to deliver it to them? Are you going to, which medium are you going to choose? Are you going to use print, TV, radio, digital? When do you want them to see it? With radio, uh, with TV, and with digital, you can choose the exact time slots of the day. And in the first session yesterday, they pointed out that brands, big brands, actually craft their creatives to match the exact time which is supposed to be uploaded. Because at a different time of the day, you're in a different mindset. You want to see uplifting content in the morning. You don't want to open your feed and see a brand posting about a sad story. Or you don't want to see something that tugs on your heartstrings first thing in the morning. That's, you don't want to start your day on something like that. So the brands that post in the morning tend to go for happy content. Things that play on your emotions that way. Whereas later on towards the end of the day, around 5-6 p.m., that's when you start seeing your typical Petronas Hari Raya ads. The sad stuff, the stuff that really pulls in your heartstrings, that comes out later in the day. So this is the stuff that, as marketers, we tend to focus on. But one thing that I've noticed is not a lot of people focus on where the content appears. Sorry, there's a delay. Can someone just please click my laptop for me? Thank you. On where the content is being delivered. And what I mean by where is not the geographical location. I'm talking about where they are consuming it, as in, are they discovering your content on Facebook, Instagram? Are they discovering your content on your brand's website? Are they discovering it through an influencer on another, por another portal? Are they discovering you on YouTube? Because once you understand where they're engaging your content, you need to understand why people visit these platforms in the first place. How is this important? How many of you have heard of Twitch? Okay, good. If uh, Twitch is a gaming-centric platform, if you want to reach gamers, it's the best platform at the moment to do that. But at the same time, if I go on Twitch and I'm trying to watch some indie, some game footage, some live streams, I don't want to see content that's not related to gaming. You have to understand that. I don't want to see a sad advertise advertisement that's trying to talk to me and play with my heartstrings. I'm here for adrenaline. I'm here to feel good. So craft your message based on that. With all of that knowledge being said, then you realize that one size fits all is counterproductive to how efficient your messaging is. You can't craft one message and blast it out to every single platform that there is and pray to God that it's gonna work, because it's not. It's gonna to work to some degree, but you're gonna have a reduced efficiency and reduced effectiveness of your content. So two of the, uh, two of the clients that we've worked with, and we're really, really proud of these, we worked with Alibaba Group for the 11-11 last year, and it became the single largest uh, day of online sales in history. And with Domino's, we worked a really, really unorthodox campaign called The Top Secret. We got nominated for an award in 2016 for that uh, on a Southeast Asia level. So what happened with these two campaigns is that we figured out how to effectively reach our audience. And we use it in some really, really crazy ways. We, with Domino's, we engaged multiple, it was really a guerrilla marketing campaign. Over the course of just over two, just under two months, um, we beat our KPI and we almost doubled it, in fact. So how we did that was because we knew our audience. Off the get-go, we immediately figured out who we were talking to. And with that, we decided we would engage them on their interests. In the case of Domino's, we knew 
our target audience was going to be a lot of young people who love pizza because, okay, show of hands, who actually does like pizza? Really? That's actually a surprisingly low number, okay. So you guys are not my target audience. <laughs> right, so we engaged them on their interests. We didn't just talk to them about pizza. We started teasing things because what the top secret was, Domino's was launching their brand new website. So the website that you have now, we were involved in the launch for that. They were launching a new pizza flavor. And those of you who have done campaign work will know that this is a nightmare. You have two very, very important messages that have to go out, but they're not related to each other. So we had to get people interested in the new flavor and also to try out the new website. So we just launched a campaign. We pretty much took over Twitter during the campaign period. If you opened your Twitter between, I would say 5 p.m. to 12 a.m. on the day, on, during the campaign period, you would see nothing but pizza if you were within our target audience. Everyone was tweeting about it. We got a whole bunch of influencers to talk about it. And this is the part where we got really lucky with Domino's and I love them as a client for this. They gave us full creative control. They did not actually vet any of the tweets that went out. So this meant that influencers we engaged could be 100% authentic. And this is something that was mentioned yesterday. Authenticity affects people's ability to connect with the influencers and the message behind it. Next, the, um, the, the one, without them filtering anything that was being said, Domino's subconsciously ended up embracing the humor of all of these influencers. And some of them have some really, I would say questionable humor, <laughs> but it worked. Um, there was a lot of, there was some toilet humor at times. We had to tell them to dial it back a little bit on the first couple of days, but once they, we figured out the healthy ground, people were engaging. People were talking about it. People were, clear, were we were getting all the conversions that we needed. And lastly, we engaged the audience on their level. How many of you have ever been talked down to by someone? How many of you have ever been disrespected by someone who says, you know, you're not on my level, listen to me? If you can relate to that emotion, that's why this is important. There's, it's a horrible feeling and being able to engage with a brand on a level where people just talk and it's conversational and it doesn't feel like they have to look up to you. You can feel like it's a peer, it's an equal. That's a great feeling and that's something we, we tapped into. Next up, know your platforms. As I mentioned earlier, whether you're delivering it on a website, through social media, or a content delivery platform like YouTube or Twitch, you have to know exactly what platform you're crafting your message or your content for. Is your content tailored to the platform? Now I'm just gonna show you a little visual here. No spoilers, I haven't watched it yet either, so. <laughs> so this is just a still image, this is from Infinity War. So if I, let's say this is the message or this is the content that I wanted to deliver to an audience, but it's a weird size because the creative, let's just say the creative team went and built this first without consulting anyone else without thinking about how we're gonna deliver it, right? So if I wanted to put this on standard widescreen format, which is 16.9, those gray areas would be chopped off. That's how much of the message I lose. That's how much of the content you don't see, despite the creative team having put in their heart, their blood, sweat, and tears. If I had to put it in a square format, which is pretty much your standard for Instagram, that's how much content gets lost. If I have to put it on an Insta story or IGTV, that is how much content you lose. So now you see what happens with this is that center area that's not grayed out, that's the only part of the, if I'm crafting one message and delivering it to just three different platforms, which I just named just now, that's how much of your message is lost. That's how much you're missing out on being able to reach out to people. That's how much you're missing out on being able to communicate to people. And, well, <laughs> if you don't craft your message to match the platform, well, you're going to miss out on that. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Let's just have a quick conversation around this. Uh, brilliant, oh, I love that snap. That's brilliant, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the way you captured our... But I have a, a fundamental question. All right. Okay. Uh, you showed us uh, uh, Thanos, and then you showed the different formats. Um, so does that mean that the creative person, the photographer or videographer, should be cognizant of the different layouts first for them to do a good job? For example, the person shooting a video, should he know the different formats very well? Is that your message? Yes. I feel that both the strategy teams, the execs, whoever's dealing with client side and whoever's doing the creative, everyone has to work together. And that's something we've really pushed a lot, social groups. Um, everyone has to work hand in hand because if you don't know what the final product's going to look like, you can't effectively design a message to communicate it. So why do these companies make our lives so miserable? I mean, even within Instagram, um, you know, the feed has a square image and then the IGTV has a vertical one. I mean, why, why is there so much inconsistency even within a single platform? And what could be the possible solution? I mean, forget the rest of the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world, and they add on more to this complexity. So, what's the solution? Uh, I'm going to use Instagram as the example because Instagram in itself has two core features. You have your standard post, and you have Insta Stories or Insta Live, which happen in a vertical format. So, with those two alone, remember what I said just now about intent? Why people are going to consume content? So, if they're going to go see a post, it's either going to be a video in a square format or it's going to be an image in a square format or a 2 by 3 If they're going to watch an Insta story, and Insta story has a limit. You have about what, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, somewhere around there, off the top of my head. You have to understand that you have not just now a shape limitation, you have a time limitation to deliver your message. So the brands are giving us, well, these companies are giving us more creative ways, if you will, how to fill up all that space and how to use it. The question is how well you use that space. So the reason why I ask this question is, earlier there was a lot of incons inconsistency. Take up mobile phones, for example. Apple would have its own uh, power cord. Um, you know, every device manufacturer would come in. But now, uh, people have kind of woken up, uh, they matured up, and now you have the USB-C becoming as the most standard one. Do you foresee going forward that many of these platforms will come across with some kind of a commonality? The only way convergence is going to happen is if Facebook buys everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. Um, they've already bought Instagram. All they need to do is just buy Twitter and they pretty much own all of us. Um, that's the only way forward because everyone need, every, all of these platforms need a way to differentiate themselves from other people and to differentiate themselves from other platforms. That's why Twitter originally had a 140 character limit, now it's what, 280? Mm -hmm. That's why Facebook's layout changes, what, every nine months, every six months. They change the way your newsfeed works, they change the algorithm. They're all competing for your mind share. They're all competing for share of voice, how much time you're willing to dedicate to their platform. And they need to just keep innovating and keep changing. And this means, unfortunately, as marketers, we're gonna have to keep adapting. Right, right. So, um, many of us out here in the audience, uh, we are present on multiple platforms. I'm guessing Instagram for certain, Facebook, some of us on Twitter, some of us on, on, on LinkedIn. Um, it's also important to be active, not just be present, but active on multiple platforms. But all of us are constrained for time. And if we have only one message, for example, the message that you spoke about, and if people want to talk about it, it's unfair for us to go and customize the content for each and every platform, which is why we use, um, a, you know, it, many of these tools for us to kind of broadcast across to all of these uh, platforms. So what would be your advice? Do you think we should take the time and effort to customize content for each platform? Or is it okay to just broadcast the same message to all? It's okay to broadcast one message to everyone, but if you want to maximize the effectiveness, pick and choose your battles. You, not every brand can win at Twitter. Not every brand can win on Instagram. Maybe you have, if you're, I'm really sorry, but if you're a software company, there's no way in hell you're winning on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, make up, no, make no, up. no offense, yeah, make listen. Up. no offense. <laughs> but if you're a software company, there's no way you're winning on Instagram. So go focus on winning somewhere else. Go focus on LinkedIn, go focus on maybe Twitter. If you have, if you reach out to an active network of developers, and you want to be able to communicate with them, or the people who even use your software. 
you find a way to communicate with them because Instagram just doesn't translate for that. Got it. Excellent. Um, any specific questions for Matt? Uh, feel free. I know we're all warming up. Uh, so the way the format is that, uh, I don't know if you realize this, the keynote was, uh, uh, we're kind of taking over the time on of the keynote as well, which means we have a little longer time frame. So feel absolutely free to come up with questions and ask them. And we're going to follow a format. We'll have a Q&A right after each speaker. And then, of course, we'll open it up to all. So thank you so much, Matt, really. Thank you. Khaled, you are a big believer in uh, the emotional connect um, of, of brands. So we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, I believe that uh, because a lot of people are going for the tech side of uh, social media, they're going for the, for the artificial intelligence, they're going for the machine learning. But I, I'm a traditional and I believe that best is still here and here. So, so, and it uh, actually from my work, from my, from my uh, experience of work, which I cannot tell here, I've seen that if it's more of a psych psychology rather than technology, if you really wanna wanna understand social media, it's about understanding human, what motivates them, that will make it work more than technology. So good. Uh, quick shout out to the console if you can fire up this presentation. And Khaled, before you get started, you wanna just quickly introduce yourself so people can see. Oh, exactly. Who you are, that'll be one. All right. Uh, my name is Khalid. Uh, I've been doing social media for the na last nine years. Um, I've been uh, a strong supporter of Malaysian Social Media Week. Uh, in the early years, I've been to companies, taught them how to start social media since the last eight years. Back then, nobody really had the faith that social media had grown to this big. We used, uh, we used to give to talks to small room, like eight people, and now I'm giving to like 200. So. It's a big change and social media, I've, as I've expected back then, is grown. And I'm quite proud that Malaysians have now, we are quite social media savvy and it's beginning, this industry is beginning to grow and I have more peers and there are more people who are learning and joining this. So thank you everyone for coming. So I'd just like to share on um, my presentation today, which Unashamedly, I'd like to uh, excuse myself because I was given this last minute and customer service is actually not my forte. My, my strength is in uh, social media analytics where I see the numbers and then I translate it to what to do next. Um, it's quite complicated, right? Actually, when I read my essay here with the advancement, various new social media platform, demographics, content, complement content without confusing our clients. I was blown away, so it was so much work. Uh, but the second part, I quite understand. Uh, it's about unified customer experience and efficiencies in content via social or digital media. Okay, that's a long one. So the first part, the most interesting part is about unified customer experience. What uh, this actually is, the, this actually means is, is like uh, the customer have only a single uh, experience through multiple uh, platforms at the same time. For example, uh, in the finance industry, when you go to a banking system, once you go to the ATM or you call the customer service, all of them know your name by your phone number, they know your name, the messaging is the same, the promotion is the same. When you go to the store, you see, you see the same thing. That is what you call a unified customer experience. Uh, in other name, another name for it which has started I think in the year 2008, uh, back then it was big, Omnichannel it was called. So Omnichannel is an integrated uh, multi-platform concept where all the messaging uh, for a certain uh, customer will be the same. Uh, as compared to the multi-channel, it's not integrated, whereby uh, you may go to the store and they don't know you, they don't recognize you, you log into the web, you log into the mobile, they have different, different uh, messaging, they, they, are not, they don't know your, you have to give your login, different kind of logins at different platforms, so it's not integrated. When I say it's omni-channel, uh, it's integrated whereby Everything is connected. The retailer know how much you have spent before. You know how much balance you have. You and you, 
at that point you are the, the ease of uh, transaction is very fast so these are the two different uh, between omnichannel and multi channel and the good thing about omni channel is that it's repetitive once you go to a store then you log into their mobile app and then you go to the website and then you go uh, to other portals it's all the same you're receiving the same messaging again and again so psychologically this hits you again and again what the brain is good at doing is recognizing patterns once you repeat something again and again the brain will recognize and it becomes a part of memory the more you repeat it the more you repeat it again and again the more it become a memory and it will become a part of yourself so psychologically unified uh, uh, customer experience is like uh, the, uh, the, the in thing right now but it's not like the ultimate it used to be uh, uh, it started in 2008 and then it's kind of slowed down but there are new research that shows that it is coming up again because of experiential uh, experience uh, customer experience right? sorry it's or CX so lately because of the millennials the millennials right now they don't really spend on things on products or services as much as experience they are more willing to go and see concert they are more willing to share in social media experience in the mind is more than the products is more than your wallet or everything it's not like my generation i'm the x gen we would like to buy something that we can see yeah i do love experience but I buy more stuff, but the Gen, the Gen X is changing the way the world is living right now. They are going for the experiential economy. And countries right now are focusing more on experiential. As people get more comfortable, they are becoming more wealthy, their needs are, are covered, so they are going for new experiences. So this is the result as well. Uh, Econ consultancy conducted survey for digital marketing trends. They asked all uh, a lot of uh, companies to share what is the most exciting opportunity in 2019. So you can see that social is at the lowest. Anybody can have a social media platform. Right? It's nothing. It's nothing big. Even personalization for customers is only 11%. It's nothing big nowadays. Mobile, nothing big content the words you put video is just second the first is still customer experience so 2019 the buzzword is experience if you can give a good experience to to you to, to your customer which will then affect their behavior and their memories of you you'll basically control them um, right now also we are going from from previously customer relationship management and right now we're transforming into focusing into customer experience management this is happening right now so it's like a marriage last time you used to have a relationship but now it's, it's not enough it's not enough you have to focus on the experience you have to make it good having a relationship is not enough anymore and I would like also to talk on a research done by Harvard Business Review anyone from Harvard right now Okay, good. So no one's going to question this. <laughs> so this is done in 2015, but this correlates with with what I'm uh, I'm telling because emotional connection matters more than customer satisfaction. Even if I'm satisfied buying your product, I'm happy. But if it doesn't leave a mark, if I didn't feel in any emotion while buying the product, it's just a transaction. I won't remember it. It won't give a mark. Um, and the same result, uh, the same research has come out with results that the emotionally connected customers are so valuable. I'll tell you, huh? there are six points here. They tend to buy more. They visit you more often. They are less price sensitive. That means if you change prices, they will still come and buy. They pay more attention to your communication. They follow your advice. They recommend your brand to their network. You know what this is? They are your slaves. They are your slaves. You control them. You change price. You talk whatever they will. They will basically go. And but before you get them to be slaves, you must give the experience to them. So this is a basically a uh, basic methodology. So maybe if you want to try out and see what uh, 
what kind of behavior that your uh, customers, that your clients uh, are mostly into and how you can make, make them, like manipulate them. So the first part is segment your most valuable customer. Then map out uh, their, their emotional motivators, what motivates them. So you, you do have uh, these experiments. I, I think most of you guys know experiments A, B. Uh, if I put something here, what will happen? If I do something here, what will happen? The trigger factors. So you take the, uh, the behavioral data. When do they make the purchases or they don't make the purchases? How long do they take uh, to make these decisions? Uh, you can uh, try uh, using the life cycle, the purchase behavior. Uh, do they take a long time of uh, to change from awareness to make that purchasing decision? So these are the things that uh, you, you you can figure out to make sure. Because uh, in terms of uh, emotion, there's no direct way. So you have to try out an error uh, to find out which uh, which emotional motivators that really affects and move your customers to make purchases. You look into your customer database, what demographic information, so, and the characteristics. But I, I would like to uh, caution you that do not make any, um, any simplified or uh, any simplif uh, simplified conclusion from anything. Else. Try twice or three times, then you confirm it. Because it's easy to make assumptions like, okay, uh, like, uh, Newly married couple would like to save money uh, so they don't make purchases. No, some newly married couple, they want to go out and have fun as well and spend. But just that they don't have enough. So it doesn't, you have to have a lot of experiment, A, B, uh, to really understand what's the behavior of your customers. So this, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you the, uh, the 10 major motivators which are not the same as emotion. Emotion is different from motivation, is that it's the outcome of the motivation. When you are motivated to, to, to do something, then you, the outcome of it is the emotion that you feel after that. So this is one. Customers desire. You want to stand out from the crowd. You want to be different. You want to be cool. You don't want to be the same. So what you do is uh, you project a unique social identity be seen as a special. So some companies they do this and make them like uh, very different, uh, very unique. Especially, um, especially millennials. You know, they never listen to any artist. What kind of music they hear? Oh, I listen to anything. And then they play some 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 songs from some artists I never heard of. So they try to be unique. So in in this generation, this young generation, uh, uniqueness is a very important criteria. So for example, but this is a trick, you see, this company calls feel unique, but actually there's nothing unique about it, but they're trying to give you the impression that it's unique. They are giving you over, they are just aggregator of brands. They take different, different brands, 400 brands and they sell and they say but their name is feel unique. So somehow it triggers you, oh, this is unique. So these are some tricks. I'll show you some, some of the tricks that uh, people do. Um, here also is another emotional motivator. Uh, customers desire to have confidence in your in the future. Uh, they perceive the they want uh, you can make them perceive the future as better than the past. That is all right. Have a positive mental pictures. Insurance companies they do this uh, to to make sure that you know you feel good in, while purchasing the product. So they come again and again because I want my future to be good. Nobody wants the future to be bad. Um, customers desire a sense of well-being if you go to a store and you feel good at the store and you make that purchase which oh I'm really alright man I'm really good I feel that life my expectations have been met balance achieved there are no threats I'm alright so this is really good uh, so health companies uh, cosmetic companies they, they, they do this um, this is uh, a sense of freedom. Musicians, uh, people in the fashion industry, they try to give you this feeling, uh, you know, freedom, like RVC, you know, they, they, they show a girl running away, riding on a horse, uh, running away, freedom. So this is 
this is quite a motivator for some people. Different kind of people have different behavior. So some people want to act independently without obligations and restriction. This mostly goes to the teenage crowd, the young crowd. And thrill. Uh, this is about giving a thrill. So Red Bull organizes a lot of thrill, and they are uh, they are really known for organizing tr thrill. Uh, Thrilling uh, competition, sporting competition, dangerous competition. So you experience uh, visual overwhelming pleasure and excitement, participate in exciting, fun events, just like Michael Jackson in the movie Thriller. But you don't have, again, you don't have to really, really do something that's thrilling because even uh, Sephora, Sephora came out with this uh, thrilling advice, which is not thrilling, it's just a sweepstake for 15 days, uh, so women waited on Facebook, on, on they, they have uh, uh, lucky draws all the time, but it, for women probably it's thrilling. I, I don't understand that, but probably it's thrilling. Um, they grew their fan base about six times, their normal growth rate, still uh, a sort of bigger leaf in sales. And this is a sense of belonging. So. Once you feel a sense of belonging, you feel like you are in a group, you are in a special people, uh, these people are the same, we are cool, we are alright. Um, you know, uh, some brands do it, like the cult of Mac, like uh, Harley Davidson, they try to portray that yeah, we, are, we, are, we are in a group, so we are in a gang, so it's alright, we are cool. And, and being envi environmentally, yeah, this is. A, uh, a lot of millennials are really into this uh, about uh, they buy companies which protect the environment which has a higher purpose which is not connected to themselves so they sustain the belief and environment is sacred and they take action to improve their surroundings so when people buy this product they believe that they are making the world a better place and you don't have to be a company like uh, like last uh, or some companies environmental I mean GE, General Electric you can portray yourself I mean don't take one behavior and just play it all year round you can actually choose which, uh, which uh, behavioral motivation that you want to change and you want to use with for different different campaigns so for example right now General Electric uh, is trying to show that they are concerned as well in, uh, so you can do this let's say you are a fashion uh, a fashion company selling cosmetic product you can do a session where you are, you're trying to save you're bringing your stuff to collect rubbish at the sea or something it'll be good and this is um, be the person I want to be this is uh, from the Marx um, uh, the, the hierarchy the pyramid thing so the, the highest is self-actualization this is when you imagine and you feel that you can be yourself this is your true self they fulfill a desire for self-improvement that this is the person that I want to be I achieve this myself and by buying the product or these services or this experience I am living up to my self-image Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy yeah you're right so I want to be smart, I want to be genius and Salesforce which is uh, something I use to monitor the analytics of social media, they use this so people want to be genius so they buy this product probably and they want to feel secure, everybody want to be safe, everybody want to be with someone, they want to be you know I have someone taking care of me that today is gonna be tomorrow is gonna be as good as today they can pursue goals with not much to worry about they want they have peace of mind this is basic human tendencies and the last one is feel secure this is a little bit different in the sense that uh, okay this is the same this is the start I'm sorry I, I didn't cut and paste this probably okay um, but generally the idea is that uh, you can read the famous 2015 Harvard Business Review. I'm still using it because it is very very applicable in today's experience, uh, customer's experience. So it's quite relevant for you to, to, 
to use this emotion, this behavior, be behavioral motivation to lure your customer in to make sure that they enjoy the experience end to end at every service point. So I think that's all for now. That's fantastic. Thank, thank you, Carlos. I like those nine points that you uh, eked out of uh, the Harvard Business Review. So you spoke about the importance of companies having a larger than um, a, a larger mission for them to really uh, go forward. I think customers really love it. Uh, Tesla is a classic example of how Elon Musk does it. Uh, it's not just about uh, uh, Tesla or Solar City or the, or the boring company. For him, it's really about trying to figure out a longevity plan for humankind, which explains the mass exploration, explains the SpaceX. So I want to take your, uh, uh, I mean, the, so Elon Musk does it at a completely different level. But for many of us with smaller companies, what do you think we should aspire to? You, can you give some ideas? Yeah, um, we, don't, we, can, we can aspire to go to the moon. There's no, there's no wrong with that. You know, we can aspire as high, but as much as our level we can go, I mean, we have to dream as far as possible, but it has to be to a certain vision where we can probably challenge ourselves, uh, you know, don't like for example you don't just have to stay in malaysia you can go regionally you, you can go big you can grow beyond anything that can happen the thing is for me the wonderful I'm, I'm i'm a humanist in the sense that i believe we have, we have unlimited potential we're the only living thing that can go so far ahead. other other living things they can go a tree can go as high as a tree a, a cat can go it can jump as high but we can be do amazing things but be realistic and not too far ahead but you, you, you have to have that hope that, that you can achieve something so it will push you every day and every day even Elon Musk I think he's not too sure he just wants it that bad he works so hard that bad but you see how if you put something ahead and at least you work you know if you go for the stars you reach the moon that kind of thing but there's nothing wrong with hoping yeah. and there's no limit so i don't want to put limits but just make sure that it's achievable and not so crazy like going to saturn we even haven't even been mass yet yeah. so i believe that put something just above you so you are always chasing the carrot in front of you never 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 be comfortable yeah yeah completely agree uh, uh, so if, if i took a poll across this hall and how many, of, how many of us would like to be more uh, ecologically sensitive um, and, and, you know, every one of us would agree, right? But yet, just look at the tables in front of you, you have your water bottles right up there, which means that each one of us are adding to the problem. So this is a great opportunity for a company, for a big company to come and say, hey, here is uh, a very ecologically uh, sensitive, uh, biodegradable kind of a plastic, and then we can, uh, we are willing to spend that money. My tech would be willing to spend that money in buying this. I think those are the things that you are yeah. referring to, correct? Yeah. And, and if you post this thing in social media, look, my company is, is changing this, we are collecting plastic bottles. It's a simple thing, but that posting is going to receive so many likes, and people are going to have, oh, this company is doing good, is doing, is doing what is uh, other than. Uh, making just profit is making the lower better. With the millennials, you're going to score big with this. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, Carlin. Really appreciate it. Which also explains why we all participate in the Ice Bucket Challenge. Yeah, uh, yeah. so thank, thank you so much. So, uh, you know, why, uh, since every one of them spoke about a lot of social media and uh, how we, you know, how to do analytics within social media, how to use the channels and effective ways of doing it. Uh, since I come from a very strong technology background, uh, what I thought is I'll probably start to take my experience back into the 20 years and uh, look to s tell uh, where we went wrong uh, building software products. Um, you know, the biggest mistakes, you know, we've, uh, we've done so well in taking certain products to market and we've, we've raised uh, millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, some of the companies even got acquired by Oracle uh, as part of uh, you know, uh, the early 2000s when we started building some of these products. Uh, but you know, even working with entrepreneurs, even with some of the most established uh, enterprises, even with the public sector, when we build software products, uh, there were many times where we failed, when we failed miserably. 
Why? Because uh, the customers only want to build software. Uh, you know, they, you know, it's just the software, but they have not uh, made it relevant uh, to to be used uh, while in, in, in operation. You know, yesterday uh, AJ and everyone was talking about humanizing uh, the products. So you know, we must humanize the software products if you really want to get uh, the greatest value out of it. Uh, I don't know, this gentleman was talking about uh, Amazon Echo. Uh, you know, we live in a world where everything is integrated now. And, um, you know, if we, uh, and, and, and that user experience and that simplicity is what's going to drive and you're going to keep using that, you know, and as the more Amazon starts integrating, uh, the chance of you leaving that product out is going to be, uh, you know, next to nothing, right? You, you, you will not uh, do that. So, uh, so, yeah, so what I thought is, uh, so I'll make it relevant today for that. Now, uh, talking about whether it's Amazon Echo that we will use, whether it's uh, Airbnb, whether it's uh, even the, some of the uh, Twitters or the Facebook, you know, we have become uh, very entitled as part of, uh, you know, using these applications, you know. Um, even when you want to go into a website, I think here you use Lamad, Lamu, Lamu, or some e-commerce channel, yeah? Lazada. Lazada, yeah. Um, or whether you go to eBay or whatever it is, you know, uh, people expect now everything to happen in a snap. You know, if if it's not uh, going to give you that seamless experience, if it's not going to like, uh, not was saying earlier, if it's not the content is not curated properly, chances are that you are just going to uh, leave that site because you you just want that seamless experience. You also want that. Um, ease of access and you need to be able to navigate uh, to uh, different pages in time to come, you know, in, 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 a, in a flash. And uh, all of you have gone into privileged banking, I would assume, right? Now, when we use these apps, uh, our natural instinct is that just like how you get privileged banking experience, you also expect these apps to give that privileged banking experience. It has to uh, you know, give that experience for you. If it's not there, you know, you're not gonna be a happy, happy camper. And also, you know, the latest reports say, you know, all of us use mobile phones. And um, you know, in an app, when you build it, if you're in a page where you have to make a decision and if you're taking more than 20 seconds to make a decision, and if the app is not user-friendly to that level, chances are you're gonna lose that customer. So there's a lot of research being done where people expect uh, when you come to a page, within 20 to 30 seconds, you must get the customers uh, to, to hook on to you. If you're not, you're gonna lose that customer. So that's how uh, you know, critical it is uh, when you're building software products. Let's go back. Uh, Um, you know, um, one thing that you need to understand is uh, when you are buying a product, you need to uh, go through uh, three stages. You know, one is um, you obviously have to do a lot of marketing and you need to create the hype uh, to attract the customers. And once you attract the customer, when the person buys the product, you also need to make sure that whatever the marketing and the sales sold to you, the application actually do live up to that, right? And then, obviously, um, until such time you uh, sunset that, uh, you know, the device or whatever you use, you need to make sure the support and everything is available, otherwise, again, you're not gonna be a happy camper. Why I'm saying all of this is, any positive experience is going to create a lot of influences, and through that you will have great reviews and all of that is going to create a lot of momentum for you. Anything short of um, you know your expectation as a user, that's going to create a massive uh, turn off. You know, so so it's going to be key. So I'm gonna my um, you know presentation is going to revolve around three hours. I want you to remember. It's regular, it's relationship, and relevance. So, uh, 
Now, um, Apple does this uh, really well. You know, uh, when it comes to uh, You know, with Apple, um, they uh, even before they do the pre-launch, uh, they with the during the post-launch or and even to sunset the application, Apple constantly you know make sure that they keep that digital engagement uh, with the users. You know, they'll con co continuously update the people about hey, look what's next to come. The adverts are so subtle and the messaging is so great, uh, just so that you know you 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 give that hype so that the people are gonna uh, hook on to you, um, you know, and then wait to be in the, to buy the product, you know. And uh, as you probably know, you know, whenever a device Apple releases, the next morning everyone is queuing up uh, to buy that product. So I guess. This, uh, you know, this is how Apple really uses their uh, channels. But I'll uh, let me just quickly play you this video. songs in your pocket. You know what it does is if you really look at that video, uh, they, Apple it never spoke about any features or the functionality of, of the iPod. Um, this is going back for 2010, but if you really look at it, all they said was they wanted to relate it to people who love music. You know, and uh, all they wanted to know is they understood the market segment, they understood uh, what people want out of it. And everyone does not want to carry big, large stuff. You know, all they wanted to do was, hey, look, you can have thousand uh, songs in your pocket, and uh, you know, and it, you also showed just with a simple drag and drop, you can, uh, you know, transfer your files, and you just created simplicity and also, uh, you know, ease of use. You know, uh, the next one is is about the relationship. You know. Uh, So uh, we, we spoke about how uh, to build a relationship, um, you know, with the with the products. Um, you know, what Apple does is uh, when um, when they start using um, these products, they first of all go after some of the artists, some of the designers, the teenagers, and even people who have retired. So they start looking at all the market segments so that they uh, understand how to build relationship and they understand what they want, again going back to the relevance, and then they start to build a relationship where they then want to convert them to become the influencers. So uh, to uh, what I know, Apple only has a Twitter account, and but they use all the other channels uh, through their influencers to try and drive their product ratings and the reviews and all of that so that they create that hype uh, for um, uh, for people to buy their products, and today I think over close to about 22 billion uh, products that have been sold uh, within the last you know 10 to 15 years. Um, just uh, just to summarize on uh, on what I said, you know, if you don't have your content right on the product. If you don't uh, have the right level of influencers, you are not going to have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, success in, in taking the product to market. Uh, anything, um, you know, reverse. That means if you if anything goes wrong, um, then it can completely reverse where your product can be a significant failure in the market. And 
uh, with us taking some of the products in the past, you know, what we did not do was we didn't understand the customer sentiments, what they wanted with the software that we were building. Uh, this was in the past, obviously, uh, our success rate has improved significantly. But, um, you know, the, the, the times where we've done well to make sure that uh, customers, uh, you know, the um, the relevance is brought in and if you connect with the customer and if you constantly uh, repeat uh, and you know share our information and get the influencers to publish it uh, that's where our products have become uh, very successful so uh, with that I want to do one small exercise uh, I want to uh, remember the three things that I mentioned earlier so it's it's being regular it's being uh, relationship and it's also the relevance yeah uh, I want you all to raise your one hand and then use your thumb and try to clap. Just with the thumb? Just with the thumb, yeah. Let's think um, that is the product, in, um, you know, um, that, that's a relationship that we built with the product, yeah. Now take three fingers and use the same to clap. Okay. You're getting a little bit of noise, yeah? And let's assume that's the relevance that we bring in, you know? Let's use all five. So if you repeat your messages and if you uh, get use the social media to really talk about all the great things you do, your relationships, and if you build your relationships, if you keep your relevance to the product right, and if you constantly repeat, um, you know, using the channels, I think you'll only get uh, that success. So shall we do that again, once more? Thank you. Thank you, Damika. I, I wanted to pick your brain. That you run a company called Mitra, you, are in the, you develop <coughs> products, software products. So I want you to tell me, um, how do you go about building the product, uh, just walk us, very briefly walk us through the steps that you would do. Uh, before we uh, do, I think in the past, when a customer or someone comes and tells us, the first thing that we do is, uh, we would go, uh, start writing soft code. You know, we start cutting code. This was code. earlier. This was earlier. So we've understood, and that's where we've had a high amount of uh, failures. So now, even if it's not our own product, when a customer comes and asks us to uh, do something, we tell, hey, look, hang on. Your last step you want to do is to try and write software code to build the product. Because technology is just an enabler. It's like Uber, when you, uh, or here it's Grab, when you get from one point and want to go to the other point, uh, it's just the distance. It's how you go is, <coughs> it's up to you, right? If there's so much of traffic, you don't want to just uh, you know, take the uh, same old role that you've always uh, taken. You, you should be able to adjust and uh, change. So, so we do a thing called a business canvas. So the first thing that we do is we start to uh, stay today and we look to fast forward ourselves and say, hey, the product is already ready and now we are trying to use the product. And we start to think of every possible thing that could go wrong, including your operational side, including what the customers would feel and how they would use the system and uh, what are the, you know, the, the usability issues that they may have, the scalability to all of that. So when you start to fast forward yourself and understand those things, you come back and you can start to look to do your prototyping. And once you do the prototyping, then we have, I don't know if uh, any of you have read the book called Sprint. Uh, yeah. So what it does is, I think it's a great book for you to read. Um, when an idea is given, you take a five day to 10 day period, you get, bring all entire audience together, and then you start to understand everything what I told earlier, looking at what is a unique value proposition that you're gonna create, what is the content, what is the social channel you're gonna do to try and promote your product. Uh, well before you even launch the product, you start to think about all of that. Then you also engage your, uh, your potential beta users to start give input into how that product is gonna work. And in, surprisingly, we've always found what we thought and the assumptions we make were not so great. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we always now have a chance because it's only 10 days we would have wasted at most. 
but we go back to the drawing board, understand what's needed, you customize it, you take it forward, your success rate becomes uh, significantly higher. Yeah, so uh, another thing I found is it's, 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 it's worth taking that time to understand the pain points of the customer, what is the uh, end, uh, who the end users are, and what the potential pain points could be, and then do the homework before jumping into the design. That's what you're going to do yeah, now. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, so if, if I can just request everybody to pick up your, your smartphone. You don't have to pick up, most of you are already using it now. Uh, <laughs> um, so I want you to go to your home screen. Okay, go to your home screen, and I want you to count the number of apps on your home screen. Okay, so what's the number? What's your number, Tamika? 12. What about you, Are we Matt? stuff in folders? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. All right, so tell me the number of folders. Ooh, this guy's been meticulous. He's counting. 10. 10. All right, what about you, Khaled? 12. So we got 10. 12, 10, 12, and that's really the average. They say that it's 12 apps on the home page. And if you actually go and find out the market cap of that app, which is the monetary value of the company that owns that app, almost always they tend to be amongst the richest companies in the world. And that ties in beautifully with what Damika said, and that's the first point on the screen, is really the regularity. Most of us, have developed um, a finger muzzle memory. If I ask you to close your eyes, and if I ask you to fire up Instagram, I bet you'll be able to do that. Um, and that's because the more you use, uh, the more you fall in love with the product, and consequently the company that owns that product wins because of advertisements and all. So I think getting, building a product that builds uh, regularity and stickiness really is a, is a function of success, I think. Would you agree? Absolutely, and uh, I think, you know, like I said again, uh, one minute you start to make relevance to, uh, to the end user of what you're building, and uh, minute you start to connect, you know, it's, uh, people do a lot of emotional buying, right? You know, they, uh, they, you know, Apple, I think going back to the example that I was telling, um, they don't sell features. They don't sell, you know, I have a processor, I have uh, this much of memory capacity. All they would sell is what does the person want to know and they start to bridge that connection. And we need to do that and uh, you know, people would start to use it on a regular basis. And uh, that's where the stickiness comes in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, just getting that stickiness is gonna be the key, uh, key to your success you know, when you're building a product. Brilliant. Uh, so Damika recommended this book called uh, Sprint. It's a brilliant book. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to go through this. Another book that's very, very helpful, even if you're not a software developer, if you're just a user in the marketing department um, or running a small startup, another book is called uh, Made to Stick. Uh, that's a brilliant book that gives you amazing insights on, uh, on how can you plan with your customer in mind. So uh, that's, that's fantastic. So thank you so much, Damika. Let's give him a big round of applause. So, um, so talking of books, is is that a uh, is that follow up read up material that you can you can advise us on reading more about customer centricity and about how to have seamless design? Is that a podcast? Is that a book? Is that a is it something that you would like to recommend, Matt? What's your favorite? I don't have a favorite, but what I would say is. Uh, consume a lot of content mm. of all different types, all different styles, because that's the only way you can see what other people are doing. You can then discover new ways of doing things, and then maybe you'll discover something else you love as well. And in there, you can see how you can translate that into communications in your work. Yeah, that's it's, um, so. And and why you consume content? Uh, it's also very important for you to quickly start taking down those key points that are differentiators and just write, write them down. Uh, and then collecting these nuggets of, uh, of experiences together will have a positive effect the next time you do, uh, you work on your product and you're building a service. That's good. Colin, what's yours? Basically, I, I don't read that much books anymore because I, 
there's a lot of articles and, and, and really really good articles and they, they are very concise they focus yeah. straight to the point to help with the books right no. Most read books let's read the articles no. so which but, ones but, but research papers are, 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 are lovely like just now that i showed the chart about repetition is a uh, it's something in the 80s actually mm. you go back to the psychology and I, I because i tried to understand what's the importance of uh, repeating something what does it do to the to, to the mind and the psyche of the person so some research are interesting um, they are not necessarily recent but they have got a resurgence because it's been used again and again so some of the research are, are very good and i read just read the conclusion basically the others are I, I, I'm not so good at maths in, in that sense. Like I'm but the club. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but the conclusion is, is good where you can read where they they find uh, uh, the different causes and everything. I mean the book is really everything. But I I can't consume everything and it's take too much time for us. I'm not a millennial, but there's still too much time. You're a millionaire at heart, Khalid. Come on. Yeah. So oh, all right, Damika, any recommendation? Actually, um, I do a bit. Um, I uh, look at being uh, in the software world and a uh, hardcore tech crunch guy. Keep looking at what's emerging, what are the new technologies coming in, and looking to see how we can bring an ecosystem together. So once you start to understand what each of these industries do, how the fintechs are working, and how different industries work, and what are the products that are coming out, then I go back, I use uh, YouTube a lot. You know, I, I think. Uh, I mean, um, when we were in school, we didn't have access to this much of uh, you know, online content. But today, you go to Google, you do, do YouTube on anything you want to search. It's cluttered, but if you know what you want to check, then you can zoom in and uh, really get um, a lot of details. So while I have few books, which I can probably put it out on the, uh, on the, in the uh, social media channels after this, my strong recommendation to most of the youngsters is that Keep looking, uh, you know, know what you want to look for, and uh, but don't limit yourself to just one industry because I'm a strong believer. I think now, the, the you know you can be in banking sector, but you need to know what happens in the telco sector. You need to know what's happened in the retail sector. That's the only way you can find that market gap to create that niche. Uh, and then look to create that experience. So, and you know what, Damika does something brilliant. Um, he's part of an organization in Sri Lanka, in Colombo. Um, every six months, they organize an event where they invite industry experts from different sectors to come in and talk about uh, their products or what are the newest trends that are happening from the, from the music industry, law, uh, software, bank, and I think it, that really opens up the vista and it gives you a better understanding of, of it. So that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the whole idea is, uh, we, we, you know, like the world is flat now. Uh, yeah. I think uh, even all the domains and the verticals have also become flat. And yeah. every small company, even the corner shop that you might see who's selling products is now a technology company. Yeah. Uh, but if you know what is that market cap, if you can find a unique value prop, uh, then I think using social media you can really make a massive uh, impact yeah. and look to uh, build a brand for yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, because you mentioned YouTube, Damika, uh, you, YouTube recently made one small change. Um, I don't know if YouTube Premium has been launched in Malaysia, has it been? No, not yet. In, uh, in India, they, uh, YouTube launched their premium service about a month ago. And one very small change in the feature uh, made a huge, humongous difference in the way how people use YouTube to listen to music. Can you guess what that small change, extremely small change? I'll tell you what, earlier, when you pick up YouTube and you play a music out there, Bruno Mars, Ed Sheeran, and when you, if you want to listen to music on YouTube, you need to have your screen turned on if you want to listen to music, which means that the video is playing. The minute you switch off your phone, the music gets cut up. The small little change they did was that the music will continue to play even when, when the screen goes off. Right? Just the tiniest of changes and that made a huge impact. Uh, it's now becoming almost the number one music player. A video company becoming the number one music player because of one small change and that's because of customer centricity.
Let me ask you another question. Name the world's largest manufacturer of cameras. I want you to name the world's largest manufacturer of cameras. Who wants to shout out? Canon. Good answer, but wrong answer. Who's next? What's that? Nikon? Wrong answer. This side. What's that? Sony? Wrong answer. What's your answer? It's Samsung. Who'd have thought, right? Uh, the, uh, Samsung and most of our mobile phone companies produce uh, better cameras than most of them. On a related note, and this is my last point before we all get off, um, name the platform which has the highest viewership of videos. Name the platform or a social media network which has the largest number of videos. Right? Now you're getting the trend. None of you are shouting out YouTube. Right? You know that you look stupid if you shout out YouTube. Smart guys, huh? you're learning really quick. It is obviously not YouTube. It's actually Facebook. Uh, right now it's Facebook and I'm sure in a short period of time TikTok might, might, might even overtake. The reason why Facebook overtook YouTube and who would have thunk that, you know, why would Facebook become the number one uh, channel for you? videos is because of your stickiness factor, you know. We wake up on every single morning and we pick up the phone. The first thing you do is switch on your mobile phone and get onto WhatsApp or get onto Facebook. Whereas YouTube, it's a need basis. If you wanted to watch a video, if you wanted to learn something, that's when you go to YouTube. But Facebook, you go almost on a, on, on a limb, right? And that's the difference. And that's why when Damika mentioned about regularity being an important feature for your company's success, and that's what it says. So with that, we, it's a wrap, guys. So thank you so much for being super attentive. And let's give the panelists a big round of applause. Thank you, Damika. Thank you, Colin. And, and thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. And also, thank you, Kirubar, for moderating. It's amazing having you to moderate the whole session.